Hello, everybody. We're back. We are back. It took me forever to write these damn notes. Why does this damn show have to be almost two freaking hours long per episode? Okay, I am really sorry, but I am trying to get caught up before Wednesday. It is Sunday. I do not know. Okay, I'm not making any guarantees. I hope you guys are having a wonderful weekend. Let's get into this review. I will be recapping episode number four. We're going to start with Goodbye Single Life and hello marriage. So Cameron and Claire says that the night went well and you know they're excited. They're both excited. Everybody's always excited in the beginning. Okay you already know how this show is. We're literally on the 17th season. You guys are not new to this. Okay you're true to this. All right to um to quote Paige from uh, season 12. And Lauren's here asking Orion about his quirks and um it's not important. Okay I'm only talking about important things on this damn recap. I'm really sorry to tell you. Okay, and Brennan and Emily are off to the honeymoon suite. Like, everybody's off to the honeymoon suite at this point. The marriages have been done, and everybody's in the limousine, ready to go take their clothes off, basically. So at this point, all of the couples are going to do the same thing. They're going to come inside of this rose petally um, hotel, almost said apartment. <laughs> They're coming inside of this rose petally hotel, and you know what's next? the taking off of the wedding dress, okay? And what I learned from this show is that when I get married with my real wedding, cause I, you know, did the marriage thing before and I did the court thing before, so I'm gonna do the wedding thing next time. Um, I'm gonna need my dress to have a zipper cause ain't nobody got time to be unbuttoning a thousand buttons, okay? I mean, police put a zipper in the back of that joint. So Austin lets Becca know that he has to sleep on the left side of the bed because he's had shoulder problems or some short surgery or something. And Becca lets us know that she's not really, you know, she's not really comfortable yet talking about her health issues. She'll talk to him about it in the morning. But right now, they're just going to enjoy the moment. Well, that's really cute that they arranged the initials of Lauren and Orion like that. You didn't do that for any other couple. And y'all must have knew something was going to happen later, huh? The same darn thing happens, of course, with all the couples. And now we're going to get into taking off the wedding dress. Because honestly, they don't talk about too much here. I mean, if they did, I'd let you know. So then we have a scene with bonnet bonding. I was going to call this episode bonnet bonding. I don't know if I'm going to call it that. But Orion says, you know, I have been trying to figure out what to do with my curls. And Lauren says, I got, I got something for you. So Lauren goes and gets her bonnet. And, um... He doesn't even know how to put it on. You don't know how to put a hat on? You don't know how to put a, like something on your head like it's not that hard. But anyway, now they're bonding. They're bonding with the bonnets. And I tell you guys, um, I don't like bonnets myself. I'm very old school. I like the old school square satin scarf because a bonnet is just not going to lay my hair down the way I want it to. Okay, a bonnet's going to have your hair flowing all through free in there. And that's one thing if you wear flowy hairstyles. Me, I wear buns or braids and I like my stuff to lay down and in order to, for it to get laid down I'm gonna need my little square satin scarf and now it's Cameron and Claire's turn and please remember how Cameron was on the way here in the limo as opposed to once he's reached the hotel room because there's gonna be an immediate shift if you pay attention so Cameron says he feels like he's a pretty good reader of sexual energy and he's feeling like Claire is not feeling him at all right now in this moment. So in my opinion, that completely turned him off. Dude, you literally just met this woman. She's completely a stranger to you. And I've noticed a running theme because we're super behind. So this wouldn't be a spoiler. A running theme in this whole show with you is physical, 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 physical. I don't see you really trying to get to know her emotionally. You just want the physical, physical, physical. And frankly, you're annoying me. Claire has gotten dressed into her PJs and do any of y'all take showers because or did they cut that part out of the editing I don't know but Cameron comes to the bathroom and this is where he sees her wedding dress and I'm trying to understand ma'am um this is how you leave a wedding dress that you just took off from your wedding like I may not be the most you know pristine person but you don't leave your wedding dress on the floor like it's some damn toilet paper. What the hell? Cameron comes into the room and asks if she's done in, in the bathroom because he wants to take a shower. So this is leading me to believe that none of you people wash your asses. <laughs> I'm sorry, but why is this man out of all the seasons that I've ever seen? Why is he the only one that I have seen get in the shower? Or am I missing something? Please put it in the comment section if you've seen somebody else take a shower. But I have never seen anybody else besides Cameron say, hey, can I get a shower? 
can I get a quick shower? Can I wash these, you know, can I wash these sweaty balls? I like, can I do this? Because I'm wondering if you guys are worried about the cameras because cameras are not, I'm, I'm taking a shower. We've literally been out for like, what, 12 hours, 13 hours. Why are you guys getting in the bed dirty? Your dirty, sweaty bodies in the clean bed. I personally do not understand. Claire says she hasn't had the cuddle discussion with Cameron and she doesn't know if Cameron is fully attracted to her and um Claire you, uh, I mean, you are breathtaking <laughs> stunning you have an accent I do it's, no I mean like it's because you're pretty yeah. like you just you know it's like a moth to a flame you know pretty sure he's attracted to you Claire says that it's confusing and Cameron comes out of the shower he just jumps in bed lights out no convo no small talk no cuddling no nothing alrighty then um Cameron alrighty then and um I guess in his head he's following Claire's lead because remember he said that there's no sexual energy. What type of sexual energy do you want a stranger to have towards you? Because honestly before I can have any sexual energy towards you I have to actually know you. And maybe Claire is like that. They go to bed, they say goodnight and that's pretty much it. Alright now it's Emily and Brennan's turn to get off this wedding dress. Emily says she's excited to have some time alone with her husband and she's gonna let him take the lead. So it's day one in the morning after the weddings. Orion says they woke up married that day and now they're bonnet buddies, okay? Bonnet buddies, that's cute. So Emily says she woke up to 1 million texts. Emily says everyone's intrigued to know who this mystery man, Brennan, is. Austin says that he had an incredible time yesterday and Becca says retweet she agrees okay and Austin says that Becca is a nerd and he's weird so it works first of all let me just say something about Becca and Austin really quickly um all the laughing and giggling oh he, he, it's cute oh, oh, oh. but guess what after a while that gets corny it gets cheesy and um relationships have to sit on more than just giggles Claire we're back with Claire and Cameron Claire says waking up, she had to tell herself who the hell Cameron was for a moment. And um, she says they didn't cuddle or any of that. Maybe that'll take a little more time. And she says to Cameron, you know, it's not natural, you know, that, you know, she's in bed with somebody now. You know, she's married now. She wasn't married before. The way Cameron is looking at her is like he doesn't understand what the hell he, she's saying. Like, dude, you're literally getting married for the first time too. Should be strange to you as well, okay? Like I said, something snapped off in Cameron after the wedding and if I'm not mistaken, because I'm now, now that I'm re-watching this a second and third time, something snapped off in Cameron and it was the physicality, the lack thereof actually, I believe, is what it is. Because if you listen to every time he talks, it's always about physical. It's not. It's never about anything else. So anyway, Claire asks Cameron how he slept. He said, okay. And Claire says that she had to remind herself who he was, like I just said. And Cameron says he mostly just ignored the fact that Claire was there. This is what Cameron said. So if you ever wonder why Claire doesn't like Cameron, you need to pay attention to what Cameron says and what he does. Cameron literally just said, I mo and even if he was just joking, that was like a kind of a rude joke. Cameron says he mostly just ignored the fact that Claire was even there in the bed with them on their first night. So Claire says that last night was awkward. Cameron's not awkward, but it's an awkward situation. And it's hard to understand what Cameron is thinking. There are sparks there, but maybe it needs to be cultivated. They're eating breakfast and Cameron starts telling this weird ass story about his grandmother and how she was lieutenant in World War II. And Cameron, what does this have to do with the price of pork and beans in Hawaii? I just, what? I don't understand why you even started talking about this story. He says he's very much like his grandmother. She never told him that she loved him. And so he said that he could be going all day long thinking about you, loving you, but not actually saying it to you. Oh, that's not, you know. That's so Cameron says that he's very physical with his affection, like kissing and cuddling. And Claire says she comes from a very say how you feel, express yourself, have deeper conversations family, and that's pretty much her personality. And she says to Cameron that she would hope that he would feel comfortable to say how he feels with her. And Cameron says he feels like he works on that every day. Emily and Brennan. They had a cuddle session, but no sex on the wedding night. Emily got the impression that Brennan wants to take it slower and she feels that in the past she jumped the gun into sex and she feels like she wants to take her time with this situation. She says she loved waking up with her new husband and now they're having small talk, nothing enough, you know, important enough to mention, nothing important enough for me to mention, but they just, you know, exchange phone numbers. That's pretty much all that scene was. So now we're here with Austin and Becca. 
In their conversation, Austin kicks off by expressing how awesome yesterday was. Becca reciprocates, sharing that the morning felt comfortable and emphasizing that Austin no longer feels like a stranger to her. They engage in some light, small talk about food. Okay, so then Becca takes a more serious turn, revealing a significant personal detail, and she basically discloses that she recently underwent an exploratory surgery where she unexpectedly got led to a diagnosis of endometriosis, okay? And this resulted in a more extensive surgery that was quite rough on her, involving what she describes as nice housekeeping, but causing a lot of pain. She lets him know that she does get an injection that helps with the pain. Austin asks how she deals with the pain. And Becca admits that she doesn't know anything different. She's been accustomed to dealing with it since she was a teenager. And Austin expresses appreciation for her openness about the situation. And Becca shares that she used to feel like a burden in past relationships until she got to know Austin, highlighting that not everybody reacts positively when she gives her personal health situation. So she's pretty, you know, she's pretty pleased at how Austin took it. So Lauren and Orion, um, they did not have sex. They decided against engaging in that and they expressed the desire to first build the emotional intimacy. They acknowledged that it's on the table, but they agree that prioritizing the development of the deeper connection and relationship is way more important than physicality. They delve into the subject of their morning routines and their daily habits and Lauren opens up about her feelings revealing that discussing emotions can be very overwhelming for her at times. Orion understands her perspective and he encourages Lauren to vocalize when a particular topic feels too intense proposing that maybe they could just talk about it at a different time you know when they're more comfortable about it. So now it's time to meet up with the families. I'm telling you I love recapping the show but there are a couple segments that I don't love recapping and I already have to deal with four couples thankfully not five. Not thankfully sorry that happened to you Michael but <laughs> you know I have to deal with two four six eight people which I would have had to deal with 10 people. And now on top of that, you're making me deal with four additional people per family. So that's what, 20 people? Listen, I can't count. So if that was wrong, don't 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 get me because you know what? Emily's not good at numbers and neither am I. Emily is here with Erin. I'm sorry if I said your name wrong. Or are you pronouncing it Erin? And it's just an I, it's a beautiful name. But this is Brennan's parents, Erin and or Erin and Gary and they feel like there's a lot to talk about acknowledging that they fully haven't addressed everything well obviously you're not going to be able to address everything at this little meeting this little hour long i have a long meeting okay the parents recognize the shared traits between brennan and emily and they're just trying to understand the implications of these similarities for their relationship on the other side brennan is with emily's parents charlie and patty and sarah who is emily's sister Charlie asks Brennan about his first impression of his daughter, his baby girl, Emily, to which Brennan responds that he thought she was beautiful. Sarah, the sister, notes Emily's excitement upon their arrival and asks Brennan if her energy was too much for him. Brennan appreciates her energy, mentioning that it brings him out of his shell. You know, he can sometimes have low energy moments, so it creates a good balance. This discussion turns to Emily's aspirations as a wife. We're back with Emily. So Emily expresses her desire to be a great wife and aiming for a balance between work and being a supportive partner. She hasn't decided if she wants to be a stay-at-home wife. Probably not because she's a working woman. And it's a good, it's a very good trait to have. Emily emphasizes her appreciation for having her own purpose and contributing to the relationship. And uh, Emily's mom raises the topic of Emily's long work days and asks Brennan if he would be okay with her working late. Brennan assures that open communication will be key and mentions that last minute situations may require a conversation if it's something that they haven't discussed. Concerns about conflict resolution arise when Sarah asks Brennan, so how do you approach conflict? Brennan admits that he needs to work on it. And Emily's family wants to understand Brennan's personality through his interactions with Emily. Brennan's mom acknowledges that both Brennan and Emily are independent and driven individuals with perfectionist tendencies. Okay, I'm really sorry I'm giving y'all so many big words. I mean, we're all adults here, okay? I hope you understand what the hell I'm saying here. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, these are my notes. These are my notes, okay? I'm just saying. I feel like I have way too many big words on here. Brennan's mom sees this as a potential challenge as far as the independence and driven thing in the relationship, especially given their stubbornness. 
Emily's mom reveals that Emily hasn't been in a serious relationship and Brennan acknowledges the potential challenges. Brennan actually says that he didn't see that as a red, you didn't see that as a red flag. I'm sorry, I'm on the other side of the screen and I immediately saw that as a red flag. How do you think you're going to have a long lasting relationship in the ultimate of relationships, which is husband and wife, if you have never had a basic relationship? Brennan says that that challenge can be dealt with by establishing open communication and relying on each other. So Richie, who is Brennan's friend, expresses worry about Emily not having past relationships, but he remains hopeful that Emily shares Brennan's positive mindset. Brennan is determined, stating that divorce is not an option. That's what they all say until they sign those divorce papers. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Now we're here with Becca and Austin. Austin is joined by Lindsay, who is Becca's friend. As they engage in conversation, Lindsay and others express curiosity about Austin's experience waking up that morning. And Austin shares that Becca seems like a night owl, very much like himself, and discusses his work from home situation. He emphasizes that he enjoys his job, but it is not his true passion. And Lindsay predicts that Becca will play a role in helping him find a job that he loves. Others at the table affirm that Becca will support Austin in whatever he decides to pursue. The conversation shifts to Becca's health issues and Lindsay inquires about how Austin responded to that discussion and Austin affirms that he sees Becca's health as something they can manage together. Lindsay reveals that Becca tends to downplay her health challenges, citing an instance where she underwent major surgery and recovered alone during Christmas. Like she'll be like, oh, it's fine. Yeah. Like for Christmas, for example, like she just had a major surgery yeah. and she was alone recovering oh, wow. through it. <laughs> it's gonna make me cry thinking about because I wouldn't have been able to do that. Like, Where were you guys at? I'm really like, y'all let her recover completely alone. Not one of y'all could take a day off. Not one of y'all could take a couple days off from work. No family, no friends. None of y'all could be there to support her. That's very odd. So Lindsay, you about to cry? Were you about to cry when she was over there by herself during Christmas time after a surgery? A major surgery? Anyway, girl. Austin, showing empathy, mentions researching and reaching out for support and letting, you know, letting them know, I might have to, you know, contact you guys, you know? So Marina expresses reassurance in Austin's reaction to the health situation, okay? Now we are with Becca and Austin's parents, Suzanne and Andy, as well as Austin's friends, Nick and Navina. She's asked about her first thoughts after the initial evening, Becca describes Austin as charismatic and personable, gathering that he's an extrovert who loves people, a sentiment echoed by everybody. So she, pre she pretty much got that right. Navina asks Becca about her weekend habits. She shares that Austin, he goes out every weekend with his friends. Oh, well, that's not gonna have to change because he's married now, okay, Navina? I'm just saying. Becca shares that she doesn't drink but she does enjoy having like themed nights and stuff with her friends. So Becca expresses concern that she might have married someone who is herself. <laughs> Andy, Austin's dad, voices worries about them being total strangers to each other and emphasizes the patience required in the process of getting to know someone. And I looked over at mom. Mom, you needed a lot of patience with Andy, didn't you? Didn't you? I saw your eyes. I saw you. Anyway, <laughs> Miss Suzanne. Okay, I saw your eyes. Suzanne shares her thoughts on the reality of marriage and expresses her concern for her son's heart. I mean, that is her only child. Becca acknowledges the challenges of falling in love and expresses that for Austin to be vulnerable and give his heart to her would be the greatest gift. Suzanne, tearing up, emphasizes the importance of this vulnerability and trusts Becca with her son's heart. The table acknowledges the complexities and emotions involved in their unique journey. So Claire is joined by Matt, who is Cameron's friend, and she shares that things are going well, though she feels a bit tired. Despite the fatigue, she expresses optimism, recognizing the potential for a strong start in their connection. Cameron, on the other hand, is with Claire's sisters, Chrissy and Kat, along with mom, Julie. Chrissy says she has so many questions, but she asks him what are basically his intentions with her sister and do you see a long-term future with Claire? You know, are you attracted to her? Cameron admits to being attracted to Claire, but finds it challenging to answer the long-term question at this early stage. And Julie suggests, the mom, suggests that he needs time to discover what he likes about Claire. Chrissy 
probes into Cameron's relationship history, learning that he has been in five serious relationships, each lasting around a year with a year off in between. And Chrissy expresses concern about that happening to her sister. Cameron insists that that situation is different. Claire then asked the group, because we're back with Claire, she asked the group if they think Cameron is ready for marriage. And they respond that he wouldn't have signed up if he wasn't. The conversation shifts to Cameron's romantic side and the friends express uncertainty about his romantic tendencies. Interesting. You, he's been in five relationships over five years and you guys don't know if he's romantic? Hmm. That's kind of concerning. But alrighty then. Cameron explains that he expresses love and affection physically and while Claire tends to verbalize her feelings, Cameron raises a potential issue suggesting that if Claire wants him to share his emotions, the pacing of his physical aspect might need an adjustment and he may have to go a slower pace as far as that. So Orion is joined by Lauren's friends and please forgive me if I mispronounce these names. Only one name I would, I would mispronounce. Vieri? or Vieri and Tyra, as well as Lauren's brother, Marcellus. And Lauren, on the other hand, is with Bronte, who is Orion's sister and Orion's mom. Orion's mom's name is Tawny. So Bronte initiates a conversation with Lauren, asking her about her intentions with Orion. And Lauren expresses her desire to be a loving partner. And Bronte appreciates hearing that because Orion values reciprocation in a relationship. Marcellus questions Orion about whether he sees himself as the right person for Lauren. And Orion shares that he believes he has the capabilities to be a good husband, attributing his sense of responsibility to his upbringing. His father left the family when he was young and that motivated Orion to protect his family and put them first. And he said he would have no problem putting Lauren first as well. So Tyra asks Orion how he feels about being with a strong, independent black woman. Orion expresses feeling empowered just by being Lauren's husband, explaining that he grew up in a household led by women. So he holds women in high regard and Lauren expresses her desire to blend their cultures seamlessly, making their relationship feel like a shared home. Bronte acknowledging her and Orion's biracial background. That is a tongue twister if I ever said one. Bronte acknowledging her and Orion's biracial background and their experiences moving from the reservation to Denver discusses the challenges they faced regarding a sense of belonging. And Lauren appreciates the insight and mentions that she wants Orion to feel like he belongs in their relationship. The conversation shifts to concerns about their age difference. Lauren admits that it was a concern initially, but meeting Orion has diminished those worries. They discuss Orion's living situation. And Tyra points out Lauren's emphasis on financial stability and asks Orion, does he consider himself to be financially stable? Orion mentions having a consistent income and being focused on his career. Bronte mentions Orion needing time to decompress after work, clarifying it's not a personal thing. He just needs to wind down and just give him room. And Lauren says she appreciates the heads up, acknowledging that she tends to overthink and she probably would have took that personal, you know? So Tyra notes that Lauren being a strong and independent woman is used to doing everything herself and adjusting to sharing responsibilities may take some time. Marcellus suggests that navigating these challenges together will require time and effort. So as the couples reconvene at the hotels and share their experiences from the meetups, Claire asks Cameron about his interaction with her family and Cameron shares that it went well, but emphasizes that they will need to work on their communication regarding their feelings for each other. He anticipates potential misunderstandings or cross wires. Emily turns to Brennan to inquire about his meeting and Brennan mentions that Emily's mom asked about the relationship related topics and how he feels about Emily not having been in a relationship before. Brennan reassures Emily that it wasn't a concern for him. Emily echoes his sentiments, emphasizing the importance of focusing on communication. I'm gonna tell you right now, you're gonna hear the word communication a million times in this show. Like we get it, y'all gonna be talking, okay? We get it, we get it. Why y'all have to say communication so much? Brennan encourages Emily not to hold back and assures her they will figure things out highlighting his strong interest in her. He said he's into her, okay? The narrative briefly touches on Lauren getting her hair braided. Girl, I'm really sorry, but I do not care. That is not necessary for me to recap. I don't know why we're even talking about this, okay? But anyway, they talk about hair appointments and all this crap, anyway. 
Suddenly there's a knock at the door and each couple received a gift basket. The note on the basket reveals that their next destination is the Grand Palladium Costa Mujeres Resort in Cancun, Mexico. The basket contains a lot of fun items, a flag, t-shirt tiles, and other things. The couples excitedly start packing for the trip. Emily expresses her happiness about escaping the cold and anticipates getting to know each other more intimately in the bedroom. And Becca adds that they will, they'll have fun and notes. They already enjoy each other's company without any specific plans. So having activities lined up really makes it feel like it's going to be sky's the limit. Day two of the marriage. Now, before heading off to the airport, all of the couples are assigned to meet up at this lounge, which is the Reynard Social at Thomas Denver. And originally I thought that was like the airport lounge, but turns out it wasn't. So all of the couples meet up and Michael's there and they want to know what's going on. Michael lets them know that the mystery bride that was supposed to marry him changed her mind. Um, Austin believes that he deserves an apology. Michael doesn't believe that he deserves an apology for someone doing what they felt was right for themselves. Emily wants to know why she waited until that moment at the altar. Everybody is very supportive. Michael is very gracious. Austin pretty much invites him to go on the trip, but you know damn well, Lifetime isn't going to allow that. You know, Michael goes on his merry little way. He wishes everybody well. They go off to the airport. So everybody is in the little airport bus shuttle, whatever the hell on the way to the airport and Cameron makes a joke uh that I guess he didn't realize was offensive when he when he said something about we're gonna you gotta be careful in Cancun off the reservation or something oh Ryan is like you know I recognize ignorance and he just lets it fly he doesn't make a big deal about that you know everybody jokes about it even Lauren is sitting there laughing about it so as the couples arrive at the resort marveling at the gorgeous surroundings so Claire and Cameron begin unpacking and Claire suggests that they swap roles and carry each other's bags. He was being sarcastic, he was being rude, okay? He's like, yeah, I carry it and you packed it. So Claire playfully mentions that Cameron didn't help her at all at the airport and expresses that he always seems to be steps ahead of her, which is very rude, that's not very gentleman-like of you. And Cameron responds stating that he didn't help because he's been told it's rude to assume women can't do things. Cameron, have you also been told that you should maybe ask to see how someone feels about a certain thing. Would it be okay if I carry your bags? Would it be okay if I help you? Do you think that maybe you could have done that? Maybe, a little bit? Hmm. So Claire voices that it would have been nice to have assistance with her large bag and shares that she values when someone asks if she needs help. She wonders if Cameron is angry with her. She asks him if he's angry. And although he denies it, Claire senses that something may be bothering him. So the conversation turns to the one word they're gonna mention a million times on this freaking show, communication. The conversation turns to communication with Claire pointing out that she had to remind Cameron to wait for her due to their height difference. Ma'am, height does not make you slower, okay? There's plenty of short, fast people out here, okay? Not me, I'm not. But I'm just saying, there's, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's somebody out there short and fast, okay? Claire wants to understand if there's anything bothering Cameron that he wishes she would do differently. No, I think you're amazing. <laughs> that sounds sarcastic. When pressed further, he expresses confusion. Claire suggests that experiencing things together at the resort can help them grow and work on their romantic connection. Cameron mentions his confusion about physical intimacy. As he says, Claire has given him a strong no in the past. And Claire clarifies that just because she's strong doesn't mean she doesn't desire physical affection. Cameron, who is still uncertain, expresses his reluctance to advance on someone who seems uncertain and unsure about what the hell they want. Claire reveals her past experiences with partners who didn't express care for her and she says it made her feel hurt. Claire acknowledges her desire for physical affection to feel cared for. And this episode concludes with Cameron responding with a simple okay, leaving the state of their relationship uncertain as we'll see in the next few weeks. All right, folks, I had intended on making this uh, like a double video where I can put two different episodes in one, but this episode is so doggone long and I know you guys do not have time to sit for an hour long video. So I'm going to break it up into two different episodes. Episode number five will be coming up this week and I have a lot to do left. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching my channel. Make sure you like, comment and subscribe and i'll talk to you guys in the next video bye